Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Mr. Saucedo's YouTube videos. Today we're going to be going over the difference between exothermic and endothermic reactions. So make sure that you're following along in your note packets and if you have any questions, ask me tomorrow. So two terms that we've used at least a little bit at the end of unit 12. Exothermic and then endothermic. This is just the same definition from unit 12. So exothermic reactions are reactions that release heat. Now here's the important thing. In an exothermic reaction, the products have less energy because energy is leaving the system. In other words, if we have an exothermic reaction, like something is burning, all right, so we have like a fire over here or something, uh, energy is radiating away. And so what happens is our system, let's say this is our system, our system goes down in energy and our surroundings go up in energy, okay? So that means that we have this delicate balance in an exothermic reaction. The surroundings energy gets bigger and the system's energy gets smaller. But the key thing because of the law of conservation of energy is that actually the amount though of change is equal, okay? So the amount of uh, heat that's being released by the surroundings is equal to the amount of heat that is leaving the system. So the system's going down by, let's say, 10 energy units. That means the surroundings energy is going up by 10 energy units. So let's talk about how exothermic reactions behave. So this is a thermite reaction, one of the most exothermic reactions you'll probably ever see. Uh, what we often call exothermic reactions is we call them hot reactions. But the reason why we call them hot reactions is because the surroundings get warmer and we're almost never a part of the system. But if we are a part of the system, that means the system actually is getting cooler. So energy is going down in here, but energy is going up outside of there. And so that's why we often call them hot reactions, because they feel hot to us, because we are a part of the surroundings. So something really important to kind of think about uh, it's something that often confuses people. What happens if you refrigerate something? So if you've never been behind your refrigerator, which again, I don't recommend you just go back there, but behind your refrigerator is extremely warm. That's because let's think about uh, what happens in a refrigerator. So this is my refrigerator. It's just a big ice box, basically. Uh, so what happens? You put a warm piece of food inside of your refrigerator, let's say. So that's that's your food. Uh, that heat in the food has to go somewhere. So what happens? Your refrigerator literally sucks the heat out of the food and places that heat now behind the refrigerator. And that's why your refrigerator gets so warm. So actually refrigerating something, from this perspective at least, okay, heat is leaving the food. So this is an exothermic process. And I know that doesn't seem like it makes sense. We're cooling, like, wait, hold on a second. So. We're, we're refrigerating something. How is that exothermic? Well, heat is leaving the food. So from the food's perspective, if we're looking at that, um, you know, refrigeration is actually an exothermic process because that heat is now going and radiating behind the refrigerator. And that's what generates all that heat back there. So it isn't necessarily as simple as saying, oh, it's hot, so it must be exothermic. Um, you really have to think of the perspective. And that's why the definition of system and surroundings is kind of so important. What's an example of an exothermic reaction? Right here, so you can write this down. Just like in unit 12, heat, if it is a product, is an exothermic reaction because heat as a product means that it is leaving the system. So it's, it's going away, it's going into the surroundings. And remember, like I said, the amount of heat leaving the system is equal to the amount of heat being absorbed. And that is exactly what the law of conservation of energy says. Okay, so I like to think of it like this. Let's say I give you 50 bucks. So I hand you 50 bucks, and now you take 50 bucks over to your side. Okay, here's the thing. That money is like energy. Let's say I am the system, and you are the surroundings. I'm just going to put sir. So I lost $50. I lost 50 energy units. You gained 50 energy units, but along the way, no, none of that money was lost. You didn't like burn $10 or, you know, all of a sudden look away for a second and have $55. Energy is just moving from one place to another. That's all that happens in energy 
uh, flow reactions like this. Energy is flowing from one place to another, but it's not being created and it's not being destroyed. And that's the law of conservation of energy. Let's talk about the opposite. So we have endothermic reactions. Endo, remember that means inside. So endothermic reactions are the exact opposite. They absorb heat. Again, that's the same definition from Unit 12. So in an endothermic reaction, what happens? The products now have more energy than the reactants because energy is entering the system. Again, we have this sort of delicate balance as a result of that. So what do we see? We see that the surroundings are going down and the energy in the system is going up. So if you've ever used an instant cold pack, they work off of the principle of endothermic reactions. The reason why it feels cold to us is because energy is leaving us and it's going inside of the cold pack. All right. The reason why things feel cold are because we are warmer and they have less heat. So the heat will flow from us to the other object, okay, to the, to the cooler object, all right? And so that's why endothermic reactions feel cold to us, because we are part of the surroundings. We're not in the system. From the system's perspective, though, the energy in here is going up. From the surroundings perspective, the energy is going down, and so it feels cooler. Remember, endothermic reactions are often cold. Cold reactions, because the surroundings get colder, and that means the system is getting warmer. Now again, it's not as intuitive as that sometimes, but endothermic processes are pretty common in our lives. A good example of that, let's think about, you know, other than cold packs and stuff like that. Let's think about something that isn't as intuitive, kind of like the refrigeration one. Let's say I have a chunk of ice and I need to melt a chunk of ice. So in order to turn this chunk of ice into liquid water, what do I have to do? I have to apply heat. That's an endothermic process. The, uh, I almost said light bulb, the ice cube, there we go, uh, absorbs heat. It has to. If it absorbs heat, then it turns into liquid water. So melting something is an example of an endothermic process. Let's go through an example of an endothermic reaction. So here's an endothermic reaction. Notice just like in unit 12, heat is now a reactant. Why? Because heat is being absorbed in order for this reaction to occur. And the amount of heat that is entering the system is equal to the amount of heat leaving the surroundings. Again, using my 50 buck analogy here. All right, now I'm still the system and you are still the surroundings. You're giving me my money back, all right? So now energy is going from you to me again. Same 50 bucks. Nothing else happened. We didn't gain any more money. We didn't lose any more money. That's what the law of conservation of energy is about, is literally energy gets passed around in the universe and it never gets destroyed. So how do exothermic and endothermic processes happen? Well, all chemical reactions, whether they're exothermic or endothermic, rely on activation energy. And I know it doesn't seem like, you know, sort of the correct way of doing this, but the way we represent activation energy is E sub A. Okay, so E and then a little A like this. And now, before any chemical reaction happens, you have to put some energy into the system. So even though exothermic reactions release heat, in order for a reaction to work, you have to put a little bit of energy into it. So even if it is an exothermic reaction, that means you still have to like you know add a little bit of energy in order to get that to work. In endothermic reactions, it's obvious because it absorbs energy. But in an exothermic reaction, most of the time people would think, oh, okay, they just sort of happen. Well, if that were true, then you know a lot of reactions would just happen all at once. For example, if no energy were required for a chemical reaction to happen, Every atom in the universe would react at once. We would get a gigantic explosion, but nothing could really form from that. Life couldn't exist, and it would basically be a big fireworks show in the universe. So all that would happen is there would be more ashes in the universe. And by ashes, I just mean, you know, just atoms now having reacted, floating around, and molecules and stuff. And heat. Heat would just dissipate away, you know, from the universe from where all of these little explosions happened, and that would be it. But luckily, activation energy means that in order for a reaction to happen, you have to just put some energy into it. So not every reaction in the entire universe happens simultaneously at once. 
The amount of energy that is required to start a chemical reaction is often called its activation energy, and it's a numerical amount that you can actually find or calculate. Okay? Now, the activation energy can be very large, very small, or somewhere in between. Now, if it's a large activation energy, then it's often going to be a very difficult reaction. If it's a small activation energy, then it tends to be a very simple reaction. So you can actually tell a lot, like in this picture here. If the activation energy is high, then that means that it's probably not going to happen. Okay, it's not going to be a likely occurrence. Whereas instead, if that activation energy were lower, so let's say like, you know, like this, that would be a much more reasonable sort of reaction. Okay, so the smaller the activation energy, the more likely a reaction is to occur. And guess what? Kind of bringing it back to Unit 12, catalysts lower this. And so because catalysts lower this amount, that's why they're used to speed up reactions. So you should have space underneath exothermic reaction and endothermic reaction to draw a couple of graphs. So this is going to be what you're going to need to draw for our exothermic reaction graph. Okay, it doesn't have to look exactly like this, but you know, the idea is that we're going to start off with a lot of energy and we're going to end with, you know, a smaller amount of energy. So make sure you label your axes here. We have energy, E, and time, T. We have a nice little curve. Now we're going to label the important parts here. So on the left-hand side, these represent my reactants. So over here in the corner, I have my reactants. Then over in the other area, I have my products. That hasn't changed. Reaction, reactants are still on the left, products are still on the right, so nothing new there. Now, what is this hump called in the middle? That is my activation energy, something I could technically measure if I had units, you know, along with this. And then, what about the last part here, this distance, going from, you know, the dotted line down? Well, that represents the amount of energy that is released. So this is energy released to the surroundings. So if we knew that amount, we could tell how much the surroundings would get, you know, sort of how, how much more energy the surroundings would have. So we'd be able to actually, you know, kind of calculate some stuff and see actually how warm it would get. So this, this type of reaction is often called a hot reaction because, again, energy is being released. And that's what exothermic reactions look like. This is what an endothermic reaction looks like. So again, make sure you draw this in the proper space. So we have energy, we have time again, nothing else has changed. Now just notice that you start with a low amount of energy and you end with a much higher amount of energy. So let's label those. These are my reactants on this side. These are my products on that side. Now a lot of times people assume they know kind of how activation energy would work and they would assume that it would be just here. That would be the activation energy. But in reality for endothermic reactions, this entire thing is the activation energy. Okay, so activation energy is often a lot higher for an endothermic reaction. And it kind of makes sense because endothermic reactions have to absorb lots of energy in order to start. Now there is a converse side to this though. So what is this distance going just from reactants up to where the products are? Well, that is the amount of energy that the system absorbs. And so that's how much energy the system has increased by. And so if you had, again, units on the side for energy, you could actually calculate the difference in energy of the reactants and the products. So that could be a useful sort of skill to know and have. And we often call this a cold reaction because, again, the reactants and the products have different energy amounts, and so the surroundings are going to get cooler because the system is getting warmer. And that should be it. So if you have any questions, make sure you ask tomorrow.